Thank you, Francisco. Uh, we don't have too many questions in uh, the chat, but if you want to go through them, it would be great. And that might stimulate hopefully some questions from the group. So don't forget now, you can go to the bottom of your screen and go to reactions and raise your hand. And Lorena and I will be watching the screen for raised hands. Uh, th th there's John, John Cornell has a question on why, why biostimulant trials are showing the best results so far. And um, I think that if, if, if we go back and we take a look at what was presented, what year was it, Mary Lou, at the brainstorming in California, 2003, when uh, Miriam Silverstein one... and, and Nirit Bernstein showed the results that they had? 2003, um, 2000. Yeah, they, they, they were looking for for salinity effects on the tree. Uh, they showed that the biggest impact of salinity is not in the canopy in the of the tree, is in the root system of the tree. And uh, when they did some trial and they, they irrigated potted trees with uh, a salty solution, they showed that they had a reduction of 20 something percent in the leaf area of the tree, but there was a reduction of 60 something percent in the root production of those trees. So I would say that one of, the, one of the ideas that we have is that probably these products as they are soil applied, they will probably help uh, the trees maintain a better root system. Uh, one of the things that we haven't been able to measure uh, because we do not get consistent data is how to measure uh, root populations in the orchards. We can do it in citrus. Citrus have, have a very um, even root system and we have been able to do that in citrus with, without any problems, but in avocados, it hasn't been uh, easy. So uh, we, we're thinking right now on moving this, this trial and do something like uh, Miriam Silverstein and Miriam Bernstein did uh, back in the early 2000s. Francisco, um, the uh, Kelpac, is that the uh, nodosum uh, scripulum, um, the cold water, or is that a warm water species? And do you think that it would make any difference depending upon uh, what the source of the seaweed extract was? Uh, I think these are cold water. This is a Clonia maxima. That's, that's the, the name of the, of the seaweed. And I think that it, it will make a difference, uh, probably because there are ones that have a, a higher content of auxins, like the Kelpac. There are others that have a higher content of cytokinins. Uh, so I think that we should look for uh, the one that, at least in this case, it's 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 uh, it's a product that has more of a auxinic effect rather than a cytokinetic effect. And, and we know that auxins might be, are responsible for uh, new root development. So you feel the higher auxin contact is more important than the cytokinin? We, 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 don't, we don't know it for sure, but uh, I would guess that might be one of the reasons it is working uh, the way it is. But okay. uh, Francisco, don't you think that uh, just like with gibberellums, there's all different kinds of auxins too? Yeah. And so it's not only going to be the total auxin content, it'll be the type of auxin that's found in the seaweed. Yeah. But Kelpac usually, usually what, 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 what they give you is that this sort of products, they, they, they at least labeled here, they said they have a cytokine, uh, an auxin effect equivalent to how many parts per million of uh, indole acetic acid. Yeah. It doesn't say exactly which, which auxin it is. Yeah, so John, Copac's available here in California, and uh, also there's many other seaweed um, extracts that are available, but you can get Kelpac here in California as well. We've applied it uh, to plantings that we've put out at, in Irvine when we've planted trees. What, what have you seen in Irvine, or uh, Mary Lou, compared to Chile? <laughs> well, I've, I, I, I've done a typical type of grower experiment. I treat everything with Kelpac, so I have no control. 
because it, it's just, you know, with, with the saline reclaimed water they have at Irvine, when we've planted trees, I just want to make sure that I give the tree the best chance of survival. So kelp pack. We've used other seaweed extracts and it, it to me, it seems to make a difference, but I've never done an experiment where we've controlled it with or without. So I can't really say, but it makes me feel good. <laughs> so, so, uh, and there, there's another question that we, we basically we applied through the irrigation system just as any other fertilizer in one irrigation. And uh, it's, it's not complicated. At, at the beginning, we, we, we thought, you know what? Uh, we had a recommendation to apply it at a certain level of parts per million, which was quite complicated because we needed to do a very short irrigation and we had to make sure that the product wasn't staying on the pipelines and it was going to the trees. But um, uh, we said, you know what, let's do it just as we do any, 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 any other fertilizer. Uh, and, and when we met with the guys that uh, they were uh, pushing us to the trial, we said, you know, guys, you, you are the ones who, who sell the product. You have more information on it than us. But we couldn't do it as, as it was supposed. And we, we put it through irrigation just at, as any other fertilizer in a normal irrigation. And it worked. The numbers we have out of four years of trial are pretty good. And they said, you know what? It happened the same in the walnuts. We were supposed to, to put them as a certain level of concentration and it was it just wasn't possible and they, they put it in the walnuts just like any other fertilizer and it did work the same way so they were pretty happy hmm. because if if there's one thing we need we need things that not only work we need things that are simple to do we, are, we cannot have things that are so complicated that that, that if we if we're able to to come up with new tools or adapting tools that are easy for the growers to apply or to manage, that's the best that we can have. So Francisco, there's a question from Greg Alder about: Are you using clonal rootstocks in uh, Chile? Uh, there are there are some people using clonal rootstocks. Uh, I have I have some some clients that 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 are uh, that are planting clonal rootstocks. Uh, we still don't have much experience. Uh, I'm pretty nervous of what will happen if you plant, for example, a DUSA under heavily saline condition, salty conditions, uh, because uh, some of the guys have heard that it, it will solve their problems. And I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, one of the things that we're doing these days is that we're, we have very nice figures and numbers on the trials we have done with Velvet as a seedling rootstock, not as a clonal rootstock. And uh, we are growing a lot in uh, Velvix these days. And Velvix as a, as a heavily, it has a lot of West Indian blood. Uh, it uh, helps a lot uh, fight when we have uh, he heavy chloride uh, irrigation water. So basically, there are some trials with, uh, or there are some people planting uh, um, clonals. Yes. What will happen with salinity? I don't know. Uh, in, in, in the areas where we have a uh, high salinity, I have an orchard that's just one year old. We're already seeing some salinity damage. So that's why I'm a little bit afraid. Uh, and uh, for the rest, we're, we're, we're trying to deal with the uh, Valdic. So you don't, so you don't, the only clonal you have is DUSA? It's DUSA, Duke 7, but we don't have, for example, the, the VCs. I would love to have the VCs from Israel. Okay. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I have a question about your, where you showed the slide about the evaporative cooling for the orchards because there's a lot of interest in California now with evaporative cooling and some growers have gone in and put in their own systems. And it was interesting, intriguing to me to see where you showed this picture of a sprinkler per every tree because in talking to some growers that are on steep hillsides, they're saying, how in the world do you maintain those when they get clogged with earwigs and pill bugs and all kinds of things. And 
I, I think I told you on the phone that uh, at Farm ACW, Bill Arterbury is looking at high impact sprinklers. What are your thoughts on that? And how practical is it really to have a sprinkler per tree or every maybe group of 10 or 12 trees? Um, there are two things. The picture I showed, that's the beauty of high density because you have small trees. So you don't need to have a huge pole uh, that, that's above the, 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 the height of the trees. So, so that's one of the things. And, and regarding which type of emitter to use, I think that it's a matter, I think, on how much water you put, because at the end of the day, it's, it's a matter of uh, thermodynamics. It's how much water you are evaporating and how much heat it's absorbing. With this system, we have measured a drop in temperature of uh, four degrees Celsius. That's about 10 Fahrenheit. Yeah, and, that, and that's similar to the results that at least have gotten with the high impact sprinklers. Is yeah. that uh, at ACW they've measured a ten to twelve degree temperature yeah. drop? With I don't think I don't think there's there's an issue with the emitter. I think that the biggest issue should be just as for frost control, the amount of water that you're putting, because it's it's a thermodynamic equation at the end of the day. It's it's how much heat or or a cold you're you're going to release to the to the to the environment. So I wouldn't mind any or any or other one or the other. It probably if if they, if they put this the, the right amount of water into into the orchard, that would be pretty much the same. So I I mean since no one's raising their hand, I got another question for you. <laughs> You made a comment. I mean, you, you made a comment at the beginning of the talk that you guys are really interested in high density, and I know that some high density in, in Chile is very, very close, like three to four feet by three or four feet. And but you've relied heavily on plant growth regulators that we obviously don't have in California and never will. So my question to you is: You also made a comment that you're trying, you're looking at alternatives. So do you think that your definition of high density, as you move away from cultar and sunny, might change? And what do you think that a high density plant density should be if you don't have those plant growth regulators? Um, first of all, we will do everything we can to try to maintain high density trees. Uh, we really love the system. It's easier to manage, it's easier to pick. Uh, we've had this year a shortage of, uh, I remember several years ago when, 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 when people from California or from other parts of the world came to Chile from more developed countries and they told us all the problems they had with labor. We used to smile and say, you know what? That's your problem, not ours. And it is our problem these days. We have a huge shortage of labor. Uh, we don't have any more Chileans speaking on the orchards. They're usually people coming from Haiti, from Peru, from Bolivia, from uh, Colombia, from Venezuela. Uh, it, it's amazing. Chileans don't want to work in the orchards anymore. So we need to make orchards that are easier for the people that work with us to work in those orchards, that they are safer for them. So we will do everything we can to try to maintain high density. So we're trying different techniques such as girdling or uh, different types of girdling to see if we can have a, not, not as a big impact on the tree when we, when we sink to the, the, the branches. So we'll see, we don't close ourselves to any of the, of the options that are, that are available. And, and these days, seven and a half by seven and a half feet is our standard planting distance. We have seen that uh, without any plant growth regulators, if we plant six by two, which is 18 by eight or by seven, is, is pretty comfortable for us, but we, we still want to try to maintain higher densities, lower trees, not any taller than seven feet. So that's, that's our goal. And, and we will try to, to keep on working for that. And, and we have to have an alternative for the plant growth regulators for the future. And, and being said that, the, 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 the best regulator to maintain a tree in a high density system is fruit. So our, our goal is to try to maintain production 
at a certain level the most we can. Uh, Greg had a question. Greg? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, Francisco, you mentioned using overhead sprinklers for frost uh, mitigation. Is that common in Chile? And if so, how, how do you run those sprinklers? Or, or you know, like temperature thresholds and the, the, the length of run times and such? Uh, they're, they're, they're being used because it works pretty good. Uh, to me, it's the best system. It's very expensive. You must have a lot of water to irrigate during the during frost. Depends on what's the area of your orchard that's susceptible to frost. Uh, we have different system. We have uh, small sprinklers like the one I showed. That, that one is really a, a, a frost control system. And we've used it sometimes to, 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 to measure what happens during very hot days with temperature. Uh, and, and, and when we use frost control system, usually what we do is that we start the system about 0.5 degrees Celsius or something, which is about 33, 34 Fahrenheit. Because if it goes below, we might we have the risk that in these tiny tubes, the water will get frost. And if it freezes, they, don't, they will not move water anymore. And you have to run all night until it is water who melts the ice that forms on, on the trees. So it will probably run until 10 or 11 a.m. in the morning. And that means that you, you, the, the conditions is that you not only have to have a big reservoir of water, but you also need a very well-drained soil. Because if not, you're going to save from frost, but you're going to kill your trees from uh, excess of water in the soil. But to me, it's probably the best system. It works pretty good. And is there any uh, lower limit on, on uh, how cold it can get and still be effective? Uh, I think it depends, but I think it will, it can go all the way up to Minus three and minus three is, give me one second. That's going to be about 27 degrees. Yeah. Or, or a little bit lower, even 25. Yeah. Thanks. Do we have any other questions? Uh, do we see it? Can we see another hand being raised at all by anybody? Or if you don't feel comfortable speaking, uh, putting a question in chat. And uh, Francisco can, or we can have a discussion. We, we don't have to agree with everything that Francisco said. Actually, the idea is that you disagree. <laughs> if there's someone that disagrees, please, that'd be nice. Because you know what? When, when there's disagreement, that's when probably the best ideas come up. That's right. So John? So we have John. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Francisco, you've been consulting for a long time, seen a lot of people that are growing in different ways. Um, I have a, a, a two-part question. Uh, one for someone just getting started, maybe they're thinking about putting in some new trees. Uh, the other for established trees. What, what would be the top two or three points that you would make to people in those two situations? Uh, somebody has existing trees that are just being taken care of uh, by normal practices, and then somebody starting new. Oof. I think I think in, 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 in when you're starting new, first you have to see what, what your conditions are. And, and when you see what your soil, water, and, and, and climate conditions are, define where you want to plant, what you want to plant, do you have enough water for that? How are you going to set up your irrigation system? I think that one of the things that we have seen uh, and we're really taking care of these days is irrigation systems. Uh, I have a client, he, he runs about 4,000 acres and uh, he's just, he has a very new, he owned, developed, um, program that runs all the information of all his orchards and you can compare them in only just one big screen. 
And the other day he said, you know what? I want to talk about the cost of irrigation maintenance. And we were comparing different orchards. It was amazing. The more money we spend uh, on uh, keeping our uh, micro sprinklers unplugged, on uh, having someone having to go look for it, that they don't get plugged and, and uh, fixing the system and that there was a breakage somewhere, those are the ones that also have the lowest production. The ones with the lowest maintaining costs for irrigation were usually the most productive ones. And that means that one of the things that if you're in someone going into production, if you wanna set up a new orchard, one of the things that I would say, you know what? Please, when you do the project for your irrigation system, spend a lot of money there. Spend a lot of money in your filtration system. Uh, if, 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 if the calculations say, you know what, you have to use this type of filter probably, you know what, use twice of that. You, you, you have to consider that if, if, if you're using a water that comes from a channel, a channel, a channel, channel, which is the word? Canal. Canal, okay. Uh, there will be some sediments and, and, and that might plug your emitters. And, and sometimes they pass the first barrier of filters, but as they keeps going through the system and the uh, speed of the water starts dropping and the distance between the particles and the lower part of the pipe is also lower, you will have precipitation of, 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 of material that was in suspension. So at some point you have to rethink if you need more filters after your, your pumping station. And, and that's something that we, we've been thinking these days. And, 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 and I think that here in Chile, at least, we spend very little money really thinking on what our system should do for us to keep our emitters unplugged. And um, probably, and, 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 and for, for if, if, you're, if you're setting up an orchard, I would also say, you know what? Take care of your pollinizers or pollinators. Mm -hmm. Please put enough pollinators on your orchard. I don't know which one are the ones using the most these days in California. What is it, Mary Lou? Uh, Sutano? Uh, or? People probably, so they're Zutano, Bacon, Edinger. Okay. But there's some interest. Some people are planning Sharwell now because Sharwell is, uh, um, has good fruit quality if you're looking for alternative fruit crops. Okay. We're about to release finally BL516, which is a house like fruit. Uh, fruit that'll be used as a pollinizer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but you're right. And, and that's important because uh, there, there's a, you know what, there's studies for everything in the avocado industry. And, and, and I think we're lucky enough, we have avocado source that all those, all that information is there and you can go and read it and see the presentations. You can take a look, for example, the presentations, the guy from me, the, 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 the information that the, the guys from Israel have published. And it's amazing. Right after fruit set, the highest amount of fruits on the tree is self-pollinated. Mm. When you move towards and you go to what will be after a June drop, then you will have probably similar numbers, if I'm not wrong, between self and cross-pollinated fruit. And when you get to the harvest, most of the fruit that you pick is cross-pollinated. Mm. So, so I, I, I would add to that, Francisco, the other most important thing is to have a sufficient number of bees in your orchard because, you know, Cheval published that the fact that you should have t at least a minimum of 20 pollen grains per stigma. But now just recently, and uh, Enaki Hermanza up that to about 40 to 60. Yeah. And most recently now, David Padamore out of Australia with research in Australia and New Zealand, they're saying you need over a hundred pollen grains for stigma. Well, the only way you're gonna get those pollen grains on the stigma is by having a vector. You're not gonna have wind, you're gonna need an insect. And the insect that we can use is honeybees. And maybe we, we need to look at here like they, that uh, Gadi Sham did in Israel. Maybe we need to augment our honeybees with um, 
bumblebees, I don't know, but we definitely need to make sure that we have enough honeybees in our orchards to move that pollen around. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and I think that as, as, as pollination, as fruit set conditions are, are pushed to a limit, let's say we have temperature issues or, or uh, humidity issues, as we have different sources of pollen, we will probably get better fruit set than if we only have has. So, so the, the, the more limiting the conditions, the more you need a, 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 the cross pollination. What about drip versus uh, mini micro sprinklers? I love micro sprinklers. <laughs> a lot, a lot better than drippers. Yeah. <laughs> So, so we have two. We have two other people with their hands raised. We'll go to Keith first. Thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, thank you very much, Francisco. It's been a, a very good discussion, and I, I enjoyed your presentation. The the similarities with California and Chile um, are virtually identical on a lot of fronts. But you talked about um, the salinity issues that you guys are having, and I think that's where you're uh, getting some benefit. I. I may have missed some of it, but that's where you were talking about the, the kelp pack. Is there anything else that you can, because I think the salinity factor in California is very severe as far as where we're seeing a lot of loss of production. Could you maybe talk a little bit about um, any products you're using to help mitigate uh, chloride levels in the soil? And um, then I, I think I'd like to maybe be the first one to challenge you on the comment of the cost of the overhead irrigation for frost control or for heat control, because we've talked, been talking about it for a few years now, and um, Mr. Cornell's come up with some pretty affordable ways, but there's other companies doing it. But the, the results that we've seen from heat damage in recent years I think there's been growers with two seasons of crop loss from it. So um, if you could put in, if a grower could apply a system that costs even upwards of a couple thousand dollars an acre, I convert everything to a cost per acre or using it, bin, it will pay for itself. bins of fruit, um, a bin or two of fruit is worth the cost on trying to protect it. Sure. Um, but anyways, maybe you can, I apologize if I missed it, but any, any help on products or mitigation of chloride levels in the soil? I know that's a broad subject, but if you could help explain that a little bit. I think it's pretty difficult because chlorides have a negative charge. It's not like uh, sodium that has a positive charge and you could replace it with calcium. So usually when you, you, you see products for managing salt in the soil or salts in the soil, they're basically related to sodium. I've never seen anyone that works with chlorides. Uh, so as far as products that will help you uh, reduce the level of chlorides in the soil, I don't know of any, if there's any available. Um, I think that at some point, uh, probably leaching is one of the best ways to uh, throw them away because as they are negative charge, they will they will leach as you uh, over irrigate a little bit. Uh, and again, coming to to what we were discussing uh, uh, a couple of minutes ago, you have to be very careful because the biggest effect of salinity is on your roots in on, on your root system. So if you're over irrigating for leaching, be careful because if you if then you cause a stress by uh, excess of water in the soil the heat the 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 heat that the, the roots will take is double and if you ask me which one do i prefer i prefer salinity rather than uh excess of water in the soil if it's a matter of choosing your enemy because from from salinity i can recover a lot easier than from from uh over irrigating the trees but what we have seen, you know, at the, at the end of the day is that we used to over, do some leaching on every irrigation, about 20%. We did all the calculations and we said, you know what, irrigate every irrigation 20% more and that will help. And at the end, we were not seeing any 
better effect because probably we were harming the, the, the roots. So basically what we're doing these days is that we, we usually do one or two the most uh, leaching irrigations uh, during the months with about 20 or 25% more of water than it was supposed to be in that irrigation. And, and, and the other thing that we've been doing is, as, as I mentioned, is that we're doing, uh, as we're also having higher temperatures, we're doing uh, daily short irrigations to maintain uh, the, the, the moisture level of the first few inches. And that has helped us a lot as we have seen more, more, more heat in the, in the past years. So that's one of the things. So, so products, I don't know of any. And the other thing is that even though I said, and I know I said uh, that the cost might be high for frost control or for um, heat control with the, with the overhead system, I fully agree. If, if, it, if it keeps you uh, profitable, there's no doubt. So yeah. No, no arguments against that. Thank, thanks for the, for the uh, explanation, clarification. And I, I agree with you. I think growers that have very good irrigation um, uh, procedures, I see a lot less um, salt damage in the tree. So yeah. I, I agree with you. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, the, and the other thing, sorry, just, just to keep adding on that. And, and if we're running too long, Mary Lou, you, you just stop me well, and say, uh, stop, is, stop uh, talking. About another 10 minutes, maybe. But we, ha we have uh, John who's waiting. And we have two questions that showed up in chat that I can okay. give you. And, and, and adding to what Keith was saying, I think maintenance procedures of your irrigation system, that means uh, controlling bacteria or uh, bicarbonates precipitations on your system is very important. And, and to measure what's the uniformity coefficient of your irrigation system is very important because that's the way you know that all the trees are receiving the same amount of water. Everyone wants to have a uniform orchard, but first you have to give the trees uniform amounts of water. If not, you're not going to get a uniform orchard. So John. Hi, that's John Schuster. Sorry, I didn't have my last name on there. Um, at the last Index Fresh uh, <clears throat> seminar, Mary Lou mentioned just briefly uh, that uh, in some places people are going to down slope rows rather than across the contour. Uh, and I haven't seen that anywhere. I, I thought I was original. Um, we lost or we damaged an awful lot of 40 year old Hass uh, in that uh, July, uh, the July fry of 2018. So we redid uh, about a thousand trees uh, down slope so, because we're organic and we want to be able to get mulch in between them. And you, you can't run a tractor across the slope. So the first question is, uh, is that something that's starting to happen? I'm not seeing it in any presentations. Um, and then secondly, just a remark about overhead. We, we only have a small area, a couple of acres with overhead uh, irrigation. And when you try to get it to pencil out just for heat or just for frost, it, it doesn't. But boy, once you have that tool, it's so handy for so many things. You get a heat event in April, uh, you get a buildup of thrips and you just wash them off. And then just this fall, we finally got our approach down to where uh, pre Santa Ana wind, uh, the day before we're giving a little 15 minute sprinkler and then maybe at one in the afternoon on the hottest part of that event. And it's amazing, we get very high winds and the amount of fruit drop now um, because we're doing this little bit of uh, hydration um, is incredible and the size is better. So um, that's a comment. And then the up and down the slope is the question. And we can even do it at another avocado ca cafe if we run out of time. Actually, uh, if you've seen, uh, I didn't show too many pictures of our orchards, but all of our orchards are planted uh, from, uh, at the same uh, direction as the, as, as the slope. Up and down, yeah. Up and down. That, that has a, a, a very important reason. And once is that airflow is that direction. 
Right. But for us, the most important one is we have usually heavy soils is that uh, water moves easily from top to bottom. If, if you have uh, the trees or, or your ridges built the other way, water will move down, will fill one ridge and then we move down and the trees will be, will have problems with excess of water. So no, in our case, that, that's not, we have to go up down. Great. And the other thing is that you might be criticized that when it rains, you might get erosion. But if your, 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 your row system, your um, road system between uh, roads, you don't have more than 25 meters, the, the amount of water that you will get will never get to a, a erosion causing amount of water. Well, Francisco, the reason we went to this was because we decided for organic production, we really needed to go heavy on mulch. And so even the roads in between the, the raised beds have eight inches of, of tree chips on them. Okay, so so yeah, there's so no erosion. There, there will be no, no erosion. Ever. Even, even in our case that we don't have any, or, or for several years, we haven't had any uh, uh, grass growing in, in, the, in, the, in between rows, there's no erosion. Erosions are, happens because the roads are badly constructed, but not because of the water flowing from, from up to down to the lower part. Thank you. So we have another, uh, we have uh, one other hand raised. Lorena. Can you unmute? Sorry, I'm asking them to unmute themselves. Uh, here, here's one. If there's a strategy uh, to attract bees, if you have a citrus orchard nearby, just, just put your, your, your bees Somewhere, if they're going to the citrus, they have to stop at the avocado trees. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's also, again, there's, there's several research shown by, by the Israelis that, that, that shows how, how when you have a, a citrus uh, orchard near your avocado, bang, your, your, your bees will go to your avocado tree, to their citrus trees. Yeah. Um, we have one other question that came directly to me is, what are the strategies used to increase the soil biodiversity in the orchards? There was a picture with good fungal growth on the, around the roots. So they're asking about the biostimulants that you're looking at. We're, 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 one of the things that we're doing is that uh, we're just starting to do something with the, with the University of uh, Colorado State. Uh, one of the things that we want to see uh, is that what's the difference between fungus and bacteria between high, medium, and low producing orchards? What's the difference in the soil? What's, what's the life, uh, the micro life in one soil and the other? We're just getting started, uh, but I, we, be, we really believe that as the, way, as the world is changing and we're at being asked to, to produce more, more friendly, we need to use all these tools and, and, and we're working on that, but we still have no information that we can say, you know what, this is, this is the, you need more fungus or bacteria, but uh, we're, we're already starting to try with some products that will inoculate, inoculate the soil with, uh, with bacteria to see how it works. And, and when we've measured it, we've seen more bacteria when we treated with bacteria compared to, to the non-treated ones. So we'll see, but it's, it's challenging because, uh, I think there's something that uh, as, as a agriculture worldwide, we haven't paid that much attention to what's going on with the, with the uh, microscopic life in the soil and, and, and we need to address that. So, but we, we're, we're using humic acids and, 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 and other sources to help uh, uh, build uh, soil structure. Great. So uh, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, you have to unmute yourself. And you do the unmute, you put your cursor up on the upper right-hand corner of your icon, and you can unmute yourself. 
There's a raised hand that under name. Yes, raised hand, yeah. So uh, maybe you can write it down if you don't want to talk. Yeah, I'll do that. But uh, uh, there's another question. Uh, Andrew Gilmer is asking about pruning strategies uh, to even out production year to year. That 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 should be probably everyone's dream in this meeting, no? To have an even production year to year by on a year by year basis. I think that uh, avocados are genetically prone to alternate bearing. Uh, but I think that uh, when you take a look at uh, what's happened if you stop pruning, I could say that basically the best strategy is to prune every year, to keep on pruning, to have flowers every year, and therefore have every year the chances to set fruit. And, and if you have light, you have, you'll have flowers. If not, and, and how you prune, probably that's something that uh, someone else or, or we can discuss in another session, but it, it, it probably we, we can take two or three sessions discussing about that. That's what will keep the interest in for, for, for the new meetings to come. Yep. Um. Let's see. Mark, Mark was asking about crop plus. Uh, we did try that Mark as a foliar application uh, rather than as a soil application. We, we, we did spray it at the same time during flowering with the, with the PGR. And, it, and it, actually it's one of the three products that, that, that it's usually recommended with the, with the PGR. So it, it works. So do we have any more questions or we, we've, we've now gone about 90 minutes. Probably people do need to get on with other things in their days, but certainly we don't want to cut off the discussion. There's Lorena. one more hand up. Okay, great. Oh, Hannes. Yeah, my, my question. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. You need John to, uh, to mute himself. Yeah, John, you need to mute off. Yeah, I think John's. Uh, John, John needs to leave, you know what? He's too close. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what, what is your theory on uh, skirting? Do you believe in skirting? Should uh, one practice uh, skirting the trees? Uh, I've had issues with my uh, workers because when I ask them to skirt the trees and leave a space between the ground and the uh, bottom part of the tree about four or five feet, they complain, well, not five feet, but about, I'd say three to four feet, they complain that uh, I'll be losing uh, a lot of the production by doing that, that a lot of the fruit is set on the lower part of the tree. Uh, do you guys do skirting or you just? Uh... No, we do. We do. M most of the irrigation system that we use is micro sprinklers. Yes. And if you want to have a uniform irrigation, you need to you need to to prune your your skittles. The, the thing is that you 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 just need to focus on having uh, the area uh, free where where the where the sprinkler uh, works. So in our case, we usually what we do is is a uh, in the in the in the ridge, we have tunnels, some sort of tunnels, so it grows like that. Uh, but I have clients; they they usually give a good fight between pruning the skirts, you know. Okay, thank you. Because even though you have this white uh, avocados at, at the lower part, uh, they don't. You, you have a price for them anyway here. But the most important thing is that sometimes most of your pests will hide there. So, so you might have a pest problem like scale, like mealybugs or, or uh, armored scales. They will come from that area. So at some point, uh, if you want to do some integrated pest management, you need to, at least to a certain level, take care of that. Yeah, I do like the skirting because as you said, you know, you can 
visually see if your sprinklers are working or not and uh, it gives that space and uh, but some people uh, say that if you skirt you know you lose a lot of the humidity under the canopy that uh, you know if the branches are lower they will keep humidity in the root zone does that uh, is that an observation you've made does that affect uh, does that have an impact on uh, the thing is that if you, if you, if you, if, you, if if the layer of leaves that you have from previous years yes. is already thick, I'm not sure if it's going to be that important. Probably in the first years it, it will make a difference. I don't know if when you have a big amount of leaves there, if it if it's that important. We we were just making some measurements the other day, and uh, we measured that where you have this, we removed this big layer of leaves and then we measure organic matter. And after 30 years of growing avocados, there was 26% of organic matter. That means that the water retention, the water holding capacity of that area is huge, it's huge. So, so probably that's more important than skirting. So Francisco, we have a comment. Uh in the chat that in Israel there's a trend to grow uh trees in net houses. What's your mm -hmm. feeling about that? I, I can I have an opinion about it too, but I'll let you express your opinion first. Uh we were once with uh, Francisco, my partner in Israel, and we saw one of the trials that was netted in Israel. But they mentioned they had big issues with bees because bees don't manage well in, in contained areas. That's why, uh, for example, in tomato production, they use the bumblebee. Uh, remember for last brainstorming, we saw netted trees in South Africa. Yeah, Basically, in, 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 that, I can't remember his last name, but Nick. That, 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 that was to protect against hail not other, it was for hail protection. protection. The, the thing there is that you need to open up or have some strategies for when the bees are in there. And, and that's, I, I don't have numbers, but that's one of the considerations. I will, I will really be, be worried about. Because we, remember when we did the pollination trial here in Chile, uh, we did a lot of special, sort of measurements or we did all sort of uh, we take we took some heavy care that the bees won't won't die where we had the nets mm -hmm. remember we had we had uh, beehives that bees could come in and out from both sides so I'm not sure they, they say I, I, I was discussing this this with uh, with one of my clients the other day and they claim in Kiwis that they can have nets that will not confuse bees then that they can survive below the nets. We'll have to see. Yeah, well, here in California on kiwi fruit, because I've been working a little bit on kiwi fruit the last couple of years, they roll up the size of the net house. So, and there's about maybe 15, 20 feet from the top of the vine to the top of the net house. Okay. And that, that way they feel that they, and they're augmenting with bumblebees. At least the growers that uh, we were doing on the project, they have both honeybees and bumblebees. And they roll up completely, roll up the size of the net house. Okay, that might but, be one of the ways to go. Yeah. Yeah, but if you remember when we had brainstorming in 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 South Africa, the thing was that like Westphalia had that gigantic net project with Gem, yeah. and they talked about how they had a significant reduction in total yield under the net. They had higher quality fruit because they had they didn't have as much wind damage. Yeah. But they actually had total a, a lower total production. And the thing that I remember was that they were growing gem, which tends to be a compact tree, but the gem was growing straight up. Yeah. So uh, um, I've had I've been cooperating with a grower in Hanford of all places that has uh, avocados under net in the middle of his kiwi fruit orchard. So it's the same thing. They he had like 15, 20 feet from the okay. top of the vine to the top of the net. But the thing what we notice is that the, the inner nodes go from like here to like this, especially in halves. 
the diff we had five different varieties in that trial. We had Hass, Lamb Hass, Gem, BL516, and Reed. And Zutano as a pollinizer. And the amazing thing to me there was the fact that the Hass has this need for maybe it's the quality they like. He had in that setting, we had 20, only 20, we only had 22% shade. Because in Israel and some in Israel, what we saw when we went there, they had 30 and 40 percent shade, and they all said the trees stretch out. And so then they then you you you're doing what are you going to do? Because the trees are stretching out and we have lower production. And what we saw in Hanford, even with 22 percent, um Hass in particular just stretches out. I mean, it becomes this enormous tree with big internodes. But the amazing thing is every variety is a little bit different. Reed stayed nice and compact. Gem was sort of intermediate and lamb is sort of intermediate and Zutano also stretches. So, you know, we have a lot to learn about netting. I, you know, the whole idea of net is to for stress. And so maybe, you know, evaporative cooling might be another approach to the nets. I'm really concerned about uh, the amount of light and the quality of light that we're putting into the trees. The place in Hanford had crystal nets, so they had very good light scattering. So um, we have a, a note here that... Uh, that uh, in Kibbutz Nidim, one of the most productive areas in Israel, the grove is under, was mostly under net. I think that the, the netting technology is changing quite fast and you can get all sort of different nets. So probably that's, that might be one of the things that we need to look different type of nets. Yeah, that's a whole nother research project onto itself, but. And, and the other thing that, that uh, if, if you see, there's a comment here in Chile that the fruit that's been grown in the very coastal areas is the one that has the most post-harvest problems. Okay. It, in our, under our conditions, when you're close to the coast, one of the things that happens is that you don't have many heat, heat events. So the, the fruit doesn't need to protect itself from the environment as much as in other areas. And, and I would really be very curious what happens when you grow avocados under nets, what happens with the post-harvest condition of those fruits? I think that, that that's quite also one of the things that we need to look for. Every time that you open a, a new technology, you need to consider all sorts of aspects that can be affected by, by this. And, and, and I would say probably you have to look also for post-harvest of the fruit. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, the comments made that net is for many different purposes and I agree. And I think in South Africa, in where we saw the Westphalia trial in particular and, and where they have almost yearly hail events and the hail not only causes damage to the fruit, but I think we've seen in South Africa when we've gone catastrophic damage to the trees. It was I mean, just a unbelievable of days catastrophic damage to the trees. There, yeah, you know, you probably do need nets to protect against yeah. the hail. But what we also saw in South Africa was that if you don't leave enough, you, you need to be very thoughtful on how you design your net structure. And yeah, I because it they, needs to open up when it gets too much weight. Yeah, and the other thing I think we need to do is that we need to understand how each different variety responds to this reduction in light. Because uh, you are reducing the light. And even in that one trial that belonged to Nick, that was by Zanin, remember he had Maluma, they, he had Hass. Francisco, do you remember what other variety? But, but the different varieties responded differently to that shade, just like what we saw in Hanford. So I think, you know, we have, I don't think there's any just one recipe for the nets. So I think that, uh, and, and I've talked to Yosefa Shahak about this quite a bit. And she also told me, you know, she's done a lot of work with nets and citrus in particular here in California in the San Joaquin Valley. And the response was, you know, you need to tailor the net to the variety that you're growing. And so we don't have that information. Yeah. But we certainly 
should consider getting that information if we think netting is a way to go. And it's certainly, I'm not gonna say it isn't a way to go, but I think we need a lot more information. Sure. So- yeah, and, and there's um, a comment again that, hey, is a major issue in, in Colombia, for sure. And, and, and the problem with Colombia is that, how are you gonna net the hills? It's not as easy as in South Africa. In South Africa, you have many things that are, are, are don't have too much, uh, are not too steep. But in Colombia, it's quite steep, so we'll see. The good yeah, thing we'll is that we're full of challenges. Yeah, yeah we'll all be busy. For a yeah. that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Keeps you busy and entertained. <laughs> very, very good. Um, we've gone now over 90 minutes. And it, it, does anybody else have any more comments or? Uh, I, I'm very happy to see that not many people dropped off in all this time. So that's really wonderful. Um, I wanted to share one final slide with everybody. If I can, where did it go? That's because I closed the PowerPoint, just a second. But I first really want to thank Francisco for enthusiastically um, being a part of agreeing to uh, take time from his very busy schedule to present a uh, very nice talk. And um, I just want to, uh, uh, in talking with uh, some of the people in the planning committee, we thought we might do a poll at the end of this meeting, but we concluded that what we're gonna do is we're gonna send everybody an email that participated today. It'll have a link to a monkey survey for, and we'll ask a series of questions for feedback and planning. And uh, the other purpose of this email will let you know when uh, the video from today will be posted on Avocado Source. I think uh, some of you, if you've never visited Avocado Source, you should, and uh, this is a good way to get you to go and visit that website. I know in traveling around the world, this is like the gospel for a lot of avocado growers out there in the world. And, but I don't think too many people in California use it and they should. So anyway, uh, with that, I wanna thank everybody um, for participating today. It's been very nice. I hope that you're interested in um, participating in the next uh, avocado cafe we're hoping to have that sometime in january but we'll be coming back we'll base it on uh your responses to the monkey survey that uh we'll be sending out john do you have any other things that you want to say oh just i'm very encouraged i want to thank francisco you did a great job francisco and um, really appreciate everyone for joining us Oh, and I just was reminded that yes, uh, the South African Avocado Growers Association has a lovely yearbook and all those yearbooks are on avocado source. And if you wanna know what's going on in funded research in South Africa, uh, I, uh, they just put the latest one on, on avocado source. So please make sure you take a look at that. So with that, I wanna thank everybody and I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season and hope to see you again in January at the next Avocado Cafe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.